If the because my Wi-Fi is probably not as good as yours because uh, you can't get fiber in. Uh, uh, well, Holden, actually, my really Wi-Fi annoying. is um, very it's very very like dodgy. We're trying to get fiber put in here, um, which we are doing. It's just taking it's, it's a time. nightmare, isn't it? Yeah, it's okay. We can just just carry on as normal. Um, so, Richards, welcome to the Astro Ben podcast. How are you doing today? I'm very well. It's uh, it's always nice to speak to a fellow Brit on the podcast, and also I assume a fellow Londoner. Um, where were you born in London? I should no, I wasn't. Um, I was born. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was born in London. I grew up in Switzerland, uh, and um, I uh, am based, I guess, all over the place. But um, I spend I, I do spend quite a lot of time in London still. So. Uh, I guess for meetings and uh, I have a, a um, an, an office in London as well uh, when I'm not here in Bletchley. Yeah, so let's let's talk about where you are because that was the first thing I noticed at the start of the call. You seem to be sitting in your, would you call it a warehouse or a engineering room? What, what do you call the room you're currently sitting in? Um, so this is uh, a... This particular room is kind of a rocket factory at the moment. Um, it's where we basically put together our hybrid rockets. Um, and um, we also have some, you know, we've got um, like a, a robotics center here and a high vacuum facility as well. That is super cool. I've always wanted a rocket room. I mean, the only rocket <laughs> I have in my room is my uh, Saturn V Lego rocket that you can see behind me. Um, see it. So how, sa how safe Let's is compare it? Having... Rockets. <laughs> yeah, it's just... Let's see what we've got here. We've got two yeah, hybrid rockets me. there. I don't know if you can see these. Wow. Oh. These ones are going to go uh, do at RF Westcott next week. Uh, sorry, next month. Um, but yeah, so that's what happens in here. Wow. So I will, for the benefit of those listening, I will share a link to uh, Pulsar's website, which is your company, which has some awesome imagery and videos of some of your rockets. So tell me about Pulsar Fusion. How did it come about and how long have you been doing it for? Uh, so this is the, this project has been going for a decade now. Um, wow. It's, I spent six years probably just researching. Um, and when I mean that, I mean we hired physicists and flew around the world um, to, to just meet the best brains. Um, I wanted to meet the people who actually were building fusion reactors, not, not researchers or theoretical physicists, but people who actually had their, uh, you know, breaking their hands, their fingernails on, on fusion reactors. Um, cause that's where the real knowledge was. It took me a long time to get to meet all these people, you know, tracking them down for America or, or wherever they might be. Uh, and actually to give them, you know, for them to give me time. But the message I got and kept on getting was that, you know, we're pretty advanced at fusion and we will get there. Um, it's just, there was a lot of bureaucracy and being, you know, we've been trying to do fusion for a century now, uh, and up until recently we had fish and that was perfectly good and coal and we didn't we didn't have greta breathing down our neck to convert to clean energy but it is you know it is the ultimate power source and when we get that um we have nailed it so one of the good things that we would have done as it's one of the things that makes you proud to be human is the fact that we will learn to power our planet sustainably uh, and that's the promise that fusion offers it offers two promises really one is that um, the other is the ability to leave our solar system. So we can't do that by setting fire to things. It's just too slow. Combustion en uh, engines like the ones behind me you know, can get you to space. Um, but we can travel sort of meaningless distances in space. Um, we can maybe get to Mars uh, in a couple of years. But um, if we ever want to leave our solar system, we can't do it by setting fire to stuff. It has to be nuclear. Um, and that's the most powerful force that we, we have the strong force, uh, the atomic strong force. So, um, you know, and the nice thing is, is that because of the success we've already achieved in, in thermonuclear physics and, um, you know, plasma uh, 
uh, study of, of plasma and electromagnetic confinement, we will get there. It's just a question of when and how urgently we want to. So, and that's just funding. If, if there was a war depending on it, and if you could make nuclear fusion bombs, then we already have it. Um, but, you know, we will definitely get there. That's fascinating. So Pulsar is By the way, a how's my sound? fusion is it company. Echoey too, is it too echoey still? No, it's perfect. Okay, good point. It's perfect. So Pulsar is a fusion company. And is that, is that literally what you're trying to do? You're trying to recreate fusion that happens, say, in the sun. You're trying to recreate that yeah, so, so Pulsar in is your a rocket factory. Company. Um, let me explain a little bit. I don't know how technical your, your um, viewers want to want me to be well, ass well assume, assume assume that uh i'm the dumbest person including all the listeners so real layman's terms i all, as i say all i know about fusion is is it is, is what happens is what happens in the sun yeah um, so the sun, and that's the basically sun has about it size on its side right so the sun is um enormous and actually rel relatively inefficient in terms of, of of nuclear fusion but um because it is so massive uh it can use gravity you know, all of, all we're trying to do with fusion is bring particles together that are they you know they have a like charge so they don't actually want to come too close together, um, and the sun can just do that with its enor enormous size. Well, we can't build a sun on Earth because we don't have the space for it. Um, so we need to find other ways of bringing these particles close enough together so that the strong force can kick in and, and fuse them, and then in conventional nuclear fusion. Uh, reactors, your, your product from these, bringing these two protons together is a neutron, a fast neutron, which will fly out in any direction it wants to. And the speed of that neutron um, is captured in a big metal wall. Uh, and, the, and as it slows down in that wall, we, we convert the kinetic energy of that neutron into heat. And we use that to drive a steam turbine. So that's the plan um, of, of nuclear fusion on Earth. Um, and to do that, we need to, we need to create a plasma. A plasma is the fourth state of matter. So you've got solid, liquid, gas, and a plasma. Um, and that's a sort of lighting, it's like a gas that lights up. Uh, and it behaves a little bit like a fluid. It's very complicated and, and um, uh, it's very difficult to study because it's, it can be turbulent under, under electromagnetic confinement, which can ruin our reaction. But we have to have, to have a plasma because think about, um, hydrogen, trying to fuse hydrogen together, it, you know, in, in the state it exists on Earth, it has an electron. Um, and these electrons don't like really sharing space with each other. So if we want to even get particles remotely close to each other, we need to get rid of that, re that electron. And we do that with very, um, we do that with electricity. So you can actually rip the electron away from the, um, the proton. And then we, and then we call it, uh, that's, that's an ionized, it, it's, an, you know, become an ion, or we call it an ionized gas. Um, and so you've got these ions moving around and they can actually, if you move them fast enough, it's like people um, driving around cars. If you're driving at 40 miles an hour, it's unlikely you'll collide because you're trying not to. But if I speed you up to a thousand miles an hour, you will you'll collide. So we're trying to speed particles. Up. <laughs> uh, that's what fusion is, is kind of about. Uh, to get energy out of it, it, all fusion is about achieving a state of plasma. So you've got this... Um, electromagnetic bottle, if you like, where you're confining plasma and heating it up. If you want to turn that into a power station, you need to have around that plasma about a meter of steel in all directions so we can slow those neutrons. And then around that, you're going to need like lithium-6 so you can breed your tritium, which is the other fuel we use in, in these first reactors, be tritium and deuterium. And then around that, you're going to need... Uh, a robotic handling facility of some kind so you can change the, these steel walls because they're effectively, they're against the sun. So they're going to start to degrade at some point. So you have to be able to change them. And then around that, you need a steam turbine. And then around that, you're going to need the infrastructure of a power station. And you're probably going to have to get the locals to sign off on it and the government and then probably some CFD. Uh, so this is, the point mm. I'm making is that to get energy from fusion, you need you need to get your plasma condition and then you need probably a 15 year infrastructure, power station infrastructure around that, which gives us two questions. When can we do fusion? 
the answer is we can do fusion. And when will it power the grid? Probably mm. 15 years um, from achieving that state of plasma. Propulsion, you don't need the, the, the steel belts. You don't need um, uh, to breed your own fuels. You don't need to have a power station infrastructure. So our view at Pulsar is that people can make meaningful, um, uh, you know, we can make technological achievements and demonstrate them before anybody can put power into the grid. So we believe, pulse, um, we believe propulsion from fusion will come before energy. So when you're, when you're looking at what's going on in the space industry at the moment, um, you've got private companies who are making reusable rockets. Mm -hmm. You're not, Pulsar technology will not get stuff to low earth orbit. Yeah, we do You're thinking once we you're did, in... So we, as, as a propulsion oh, wow. company, okay. we build three technologies. Uh, we build the technology to get you from the ground to low earth orbit, which as you say is conventional rockets like the ones we've got behind these, these hybrid rocket engines here, mm. which will do that. Um, why do we do that? Because very few people in Europe build these kind of engines. It's all US tech. Um, we originally started building Hall Effect thrusters. I can actually show you a Hall Effect thruster. Um, one second. So this is a Hall Effect thruster, if I just unwrap it, built by Polestar. Now that, uh, is effectively like a mini fusion reactor in the fact it produces a plasma which will glow here in the middle um, at about three million degrees and it will be wow. positioned on satellites and it will be propelling satellites in space so we build these at pulsar because it's very similar technology to nuclear fusion and that's the, what we do that's our sort of specialty is plasma physics uh, and vacuum and plasma under a vacuum under electromagnetic confinement so this was an easy product for us to build at the beginning uh, we, we've got a grant, government grant off the back of building it. We weren't actually out for that, but we got it mm. because we realized that there are very few people in Europe, let alone England, building this tech. It's all US, but yet every Starlink satellite that went up had one of these on them. Yeah. Every satellite going up needs one wow. of these, and no one makes them. So we, 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 after discovering that we were pretty much alone in building these, comp they are very complicated devices. We said, you know, what else do people build in this part of the world? Turns out rocket engines, they're all, US, they're all built, in, they're built in America <laughs> and they're regulated under US law, which means that they take time, you, you know, have to, it's difficult to get them. So, you know, we're good at getting um, really good physicists together to build com relatively complicated technology fast and on time and on budget. Those two engines were demonstrated in, um, we built the last two in four months, and they were demonstrated in two countries in two weeks in a snowstorm. We fired one of those rockets, and if you see it online, in a snowstorm. Um, so you had rocket scientists putting them together waist deep in snow, and I don't think I've ever seen that before. And the rocket scientists who had 20, 30 years in rocket science hadn't seen that before either because it's just so fast how, how quickly private companies can do this. Um, so we're a propulsion company. We, do, we build engines like that, which should get you from the ground to low Earth orbit. Engines like this, which can get you from uh, low Earth orbit to repositioning you. It can take you to, to geosynchronous orbit and further if you have time. Mm. Our ultimate goal is nuclear fusion propulsion, and that would be capable of taking you out of the solar system. Someone like Alpha Centauri, our local three-star system, about 4.2 light years away, completely out of, um, out of bounds to us until we get nuclear uh, propulsion working. And, and we will. It's, um, you know, it's, it, it's just, it, it's going to happen with or without us. It's, it's an inevitable milestone now that we've, we've, we have done this. We, fusion is coming. Fantastic. It's really inspirational to see you get so excited and animated. Uh, about no i love it and i love the fact that you can like pick up part of a rocket um you know you're so used to seeing kind of uh, you know nasa official shots of like clean rooms where 
you know, no one touches everything and it's all very uh, yeah, controlled. Yeah, fair, I think this sort of startup... Because it was all wrapped up and I've now covered it in my fingerprints and that means some angry <laughs> physicist is going to have to come and acetone the whole thing and grumble at me. But you know what? what <laughs> it's worth it. But it's, 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 that, uh, it's that sort of startup mentality um, that I think is, is going to change the space industry where yeah, entrepreneurs can, can sorry. Pick, pick problems and... Yeah, no, they, they, can, they can pick problems and they can, they can trial things out. If they've got the right funding, they've got the right business model. I, I mean, speaking of the business model, what, what sort of investors do you have? Because imagine they're, they're, well, they're not sadly, expecting a short-term return. Yeah, I mean, sadly, Fusion is currently only for billionaires and governments. Um, and that's because... In the yeah. UK, we have a terrible investment mentality where everyone wants quick money. They want a quick return. They want their money back in three to five years, and they're just looking for a quick buck. Um, I don't want to be too hard on in, on venture capitalists in the UK, but you know, they read. I've, I've written yeah. a book on nuclear fusion. They read it. We talk a lot, but they can't invest other people's money with a ten-year investment scope because it's just not really how they're set up. They're starting to change, um, but billionaires can invest with a fifteen-year horizon you know, they can be more conscientious in their investing. They want to invest in something for their grandchildren. They want to make something that is actually going to benefit humanity. And most of those investors exist in the U.S., sadly. Um, mm. And I guess we've been very lucky in the U.K. to find investors who have that mentality, who have backed Pulsar with a view of they're not after a return. They want to see this technology being built in England, tested in Europe, show that it works, get a good team together. And with that mentality, we'll, we'll get to a fusion propulsion device too. Um, and then, you know, the money will come. But it, it, I think you've realized it's, it's not it, so much about just money. It's about uh, doing these things which we have to do. That's what I was going to say. It's, it's kind of, uh, it must be incredibly rewarding because it's exciting, you know, as an investment, people are so used to, to putting their money in stocks and shares and, uh, you know, companies that make apps and they don't build anything physically. So I imagine yeah. the rewards are, 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 are quite large. Do you have any uh, patents for your technology? Yeah, we've got, we've got guys who are pushing for patents, but, you know, patents have got to be commercial within 20 years. Uh, so, Patents are a very sort of investor friendly thing to do. Um, mm. And, you know, we, we've got uh, work in sort of heated, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how, how technically you want to go, but there are heated cathodes and things like that, which is a very niche things we're applying for. Um, but we feel that with nuclear fusion propulsion, um, there's much more scope for uh, very interesting patents because it's a path less trodden. All the governments are focused on nuclear fusion for energy, and so they should, should be, um, because mm. they're saving the world on our budget. You know, um, ITER is 35 nations investing 28 billion, uh, and it's on energy. Um, but as a result, the energy the sort of spherical, tokamak, toroidal type devices are very is a path very well trodden. Um, so there's less problems to encounter, and therefore less solutions to find. Whereas if you're building nuclear fusion propulsion devices, we, because less people have done it, we, are, we will have more problems and therefore we'll come up with more innovative ways to solve them. And that's how I think real IP is generated. Absolutely. Uh, the ITA you mentioned, which is the um, International, International Thermonuclear. Thermonuclear. Well, it's yeah, I'll put a note in the, uh, in the if, show if, notes. If people, uh, oh. <laughs> everyone will get angry with me for calling it ITA. Um, because it's it based in France, they call it ITER. Uh, but I'm not French, so I call it ITER. <laughs> yeah. ITER, ITER. will turn on in 2024, Whatever. and it'll have first plasma, yeah. like what we have inside these reactors, and that uh, that plasma will probably generate between a 10 and a 15 times the energy gain potential, which is you know, mind-blowing. And it's the most, if you don't know what ITER is, and you're watching this podcast, mm. it is the most extraordinary machine being built by mankind. It is a sun on Earth that will turn on and we will have a star um, that we will show that we can successfully use this technology. And, you know, maybe China will, China will uh, actually do it first. But 
by the way, you know, in just a couple of years now, um, people will start realizing that the mammoth of energy generate it's not a fusion isn't an alternative it's not like oh geothermic or solar wind and fusion mm. fusion is a million times more powerful than a combustion or chemical reaction it is you know how nature generates power it's how the universe has chosen way of doing it um the flowers grow towards it you close your eyes on a sunny day that is the power of nuclear fusion uh and it's the only thing that we've ever studied or conceived that has the ability to even just even if we utilize it very inefficiently completely eliminate our need for um, energy production storing it different problem batteries uh, god knows very complicated but just mm. generating it fusion is capable of of uh, giving us an unlimited so that's why it's called the holy grail the energy source um uh you know it's the the perfect the holy grail uh, the um what's it um needle in the haystack or... and it's it's been called it's you know it, it's, it gets, it's everything right but and therefore with it comes to skepticism but people have this um mm. mentality it's a human thing where if you people see something happen in the past they expect it to happen in the future it's something that traders are trained to get out of because if you see a trend in a share price it's very difficult to to, to change on that opinion because you've seen it happen it's like if you've got people buying bitcoin and they've been successful at it they'll start thinking that everything they buy is going to be because they've seen it and they think they you know they've seen it before and so they think this is what, and and it, you know until there is a uh, very nasty uh <laughs> debt cycle you know then people get a shock and the same thing with fusion in the, in the fact that people are so used to seeing this be the energy source of tomorrow and always will be it taking more time that when it changes and suddenly mm. got it everyone will be like they missed it it's too late to start doing this kind of research then you have to be doing it 10 years before that wow. that's why um it, why we're it, doing it. it's it's an incredible time to be alive i mean uh you know the fact we're gonna see you know pulsar and eater iter uh you know those technologies in our lifetimes is incredibly exciting um speaking of uh uh, uh creating a star uh you were a bit of a star yourself um which is how i first heard about you in uh a, a reality TV show called Made in Chelsea. Now I have a lot of American uh, listeners who would not have heard of Made in Chelsea, but I'm I'm kind of intrigued because you seem to be uh, uh, not the sort of person that would go on a show like that. Um, why did you decide to do it? Was it a strategic decision to raise your profile, or why did you? <laughs> why I don't did think you go there's a conventional <laughs> route to anything. You know, in, in today's world, we can do. Mm. You know, either you take the assumption that, you know, we really do have freedoms that our, our generation before us didn't have. We have the internet um, and, you know, so much is happening in terms of the technology. Could I have a business like this 20 years ago? I don't think so. Um, and I, I, I actually left school at like 16. I set up a lot of companies and failed them. Um, I learned by hitting every branch on the way down. Uh, and eventually became successful through lots and lots of, of, of failings. And I learned that the key to success is to fail quickly, lots. Um, and if, and, that, and a lot of the things we build here, like this, this vacuum chamber I can show you, is designed so that we can do lots and lots of tests, dis dismantle it and reassemble it, um, where it would take a normal company maybe a month, they'll do two tests, we can do like five in a day just so we can fail a lot quickly. Now, why am I bringing this up in return to your question? Um, because I left early, you know, and the internet sounds like I'm a dinosaur. Um, but, you know, when I was starting out, I was talking to airlines and big companies who were going, oh, we have to get on Twitter. Apparently we need to market our Twitter page. Mm. Was, you know, and then I had a friend who was on uh, Made in <laughs> Chelsea who had like 50,000 followers in like a day. And I was thinking, you know, this is, there's no point in being prejudiced about it. I'm not, as someone who is an investor as well, I don't take sides. If something is, I'm not going to be like personally in or out. If it's moving quickly, then um, I'll, I'll get into it. And it, it you know, there's undeniably, there was an enormous amount of traction behind that show uh, at the time. And um, it was an 
it's something I wasn't really familiar with. And it was a good introduction, you know, for me, it was a very int good introduction to uh, how that media world moved. And I learned an awful lot from it. I didn't do it for a very long time. But I learned a lot. And it was a different experience. And in today's world, you know, it's a, it's a privilege to be involved in different experiences. And I guess you, that sort of failing quickly mentality, um, you kind of got out of the right stage of Made in Chelsea as well, because uh, <laughs> I think it's like, now, <laughs> I think I was still going. I, 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 oh, I don't know if it is, but I, I remember I, I sort of watched some of the earlier seasons and it, it was, it was, it was, it, it sort of peaked, uh, you know, probably about God, eight, 10 years ago now, but I was working in hospitality and it was, it was mad. It was like, if, if a bar I was working with got featured on Made in Chelsea, the next night it would be packed out. Like there was a but real it, kind of, a, it was a really de interesting demonstration experience. of the, the effect. It was, I mean, I, mm. as a sort of only child who grew up uh, walking around the forest as a kid with our new friends or in Switzerland, um, it was a really good experience for me. And, um, I made some, you know, really good friends and it was at the time to really give it its credit. It was something new and the, the people that created it, um, Sarah Dillison, who started it, you know, she was in, in her field, you know, she was a visionary in, in terms of she sold it. So, you know, Chelsea people were disappointed. They come visit it. They thought it was this place that was forever sunny with beautiful buildings. And it was kind of like this dream, but they were very <laughs> good to the, the reality of it was pretty sound you know they when i was doing it at least i was amazed at how real it was i thought and everyone's like oh that can't be real it must be scripted it was very very real and um i don't know i found it a really it for the time i did it it was interesting why why do you think that more reality tv stars not just made in chelsea but reality tv stars in general don't use their profile and influence to build more tech companies or science companies. <laughs> because it's not relevant. <laughs> I mean, when I post, you know, I've got friends who are on reality TV and they've got like bikini brands and that really responds well to their audience, mm. right? People from the TV mm. go, oh, I'll, I, you know, they like that. Whereas my um, limited following from Made in Chelsea, I think if I post about a nuclear rocket, it is, you know, I probably lose followers. <laughs> every time I do it, because people are like, <laughs> this is not why I followed you. Um, so, oh, true, true. And I think, yeah, I'm not sure how well um, this, the technology, I don't think it would be a good strategy to go on a TV show like Made in Chelsea to build a tech following. Um, but it was good for my personal Well, that, that would be a great, con that'd, be a gr that'd be a great concept for a show, like following around a group of scientists and engineers and in that sort of, fly on the wall style i think that would be quite entertaining actually for not just people who are interested in science um what's your what's your timeline for uh for pulsar fusion and uh and and testing space testing um do you uh, have a, a a timeline you can talk about so we've been very lucky at where the team has just grown and grown um you'd be amazed how many like incredibly talented physicists who have slightly changed the mentality too. They're maybe a bit bored of government um, time timelines and how long it takes governments to do what they've seen as possible. And they're starting to join companies like this. And it's a strange dynamic because I've got really brilliant physicists who come into Pulsar and, you know, to start with, I think I probably get a bit of a hard time. They're like, you know, who is this guy? Um, <laughs> and they are, you know, I have to kind of prove myself by working much, much harder. So don't, I don't have a PhD. So before I say anything, I have to be double mm. sure that I'm, I'm, I'm right. Or at, at least, um, I, I find myself working three times harder than the PhDs to make sure that I can just keep up with them. But it's meant that I've had a very accelerated learning process. And, um, at the same time, they have seen my time frames, which have, you know, I think they originally think are unrealistic, but that's where I have my skill set is, is, is making things work really, really fast and having a, uh, a, a team where we just, we just take on something at what seems an impossible time frame. And if we even sort of get it half right, it, we still achieve a lot. So we've so far have absolutely knocked the lights out with what we've done in the time frame, And we have ambitious 
plans going forward. And in fact, we want to turn on our nuclear fusion propulsion uh, sort of, it's like in another room like this, which we'll be building a sort of static device. We want to have that demonstrated and turned on by 2025. And we want to start building it this year. The issue is that as the, to do that, it's obviously big, big money. And to get more of that money in, the company has to grow in size in terms of investors and therefore in terms of opinions. And just by proxy, that will slow us down. Not saying that those opinions aren't going to be valid, but the bigger a company gets, the slower it gets. Um, and that's very difficult to, to try and combat that. Um, so we're going to be doing our best to make sure that as we grow, we don't sort of shackle ourselves. Because if we're going to continue to hit milestones in this time frame, we need to be able to attract more investment, uh, give that investment, you know, and there's investors that say and, and that they will require, understandably, without slowing ourselves down. And that's um, kind of science of it, too. What do you think is going to be Pulsar Fusion's uh, eureka moment? You've, you've had lots of successes to date, but is there a particular tipping point where um, all the dots are going to connect and it suddenly becomes commercially uh, well, look, it, very, uh, it, very big? If you look at... Um, the name escapes me. What's that girl that's just been sentenced in America, Theranos? technologies for um, the blood sampling. I mean, I haven't got my phone on me. What's her name? I don't know. It's all right. I'll check it and I'll put it in the show notes. Hang on. Uh, Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, so she had this, oh, of course. This, yes. Yeah. Now, she was making promises to investors about a technology which, whether or not she believed or didn't believe was possible, and investors backed her, accredited investors, to, mm. to build this technology. And it turned out that through an investigation, the technology didn't exist. Um, and now she's being prosecuted for it. Um, this is changing, you know, this, the, the world of this kind of investment, because a lot of bluff it till you make it mentality in startups. Uh, and there's a, an element of that which is healthy. You know, you can't set up a company and say to investors, we have nothing, we're a startup. <laughs> you have to be able to come up with some kind of narrative to get people. That's the whole point of businesses. But you also have to be very careful that you're not lying. But at the same time, there is a responsibility from an investor's point of view that they should do their due diligence. So if I'm an accredited yeah. investor who is investing money that I can afford to lose, in a technology that I know isn't possible yet, but I believe may be possible, then at some point someone's got to take an assumption. Now, nuclear fusion, as far as I'm concerned, is a done, it, you know, I think most people say, oh, that's very scary. There's many things that can go wrong with it. Oh, you know, this is very bold. But as far as I have in my research, and I have had the opportunity to talk to the best brains on this planet, um, I believe that it is the technology. I mean, look, the sun, you look at the sun shining, it is sound. And if we can replicate that technology on Earth, which we can, look at JET in 1997, joint European Taurus, um, look at what ITER will do, then we will have fusion for energy. And if we have fusion for energy, then we'll have it for propulsion. And that ultimately means, I mean, this is how my mind thinks. Now, there are other minds out there that will be much yeah. more skeptical and say, oh, but there's so many things that have, you know, little innovations. But, you know, if, if you're that kind of person, then you just don't invest. Um, and you wait till everything's proven out. And by that point, you'll be buying in at a ridiculous valuation. And there'll be no money there because you have to take a risk to warrant that return. Um, mm. So our milestone, our main, my, for me, my absolute main milestone is to prove out the systems that will enable people to turn a nuclear fusion power, uh, a nuclear fusion plasma, uh, so can we call it a plasma burn, um, to prove out the technologies that enable that for propulsion. And there are a lot of problems that we will encounter. 
I don't know what they will all be because I haven't built it yet. So I'm asking investors to take mm. a big risk with me. Uh, and that's just being as honest as possible. But I truly believe, and I have backed this with my own money, that this is a multi, multi trillion. It's the biggest. It's not just, you know, I, I think <laughs> that nuclear fusion is a, it's a, you know, it's like a milestone of a, of a species before, you know, mm. we become a fusion capable species. It's not like a nap or marijuana, CBD, 3D printing. This is the ability for mm. a race to emulate a star, give us the most powerful energy source that we've ever experienced. You know, nuclear has been responsible for the worst things we've ever done, but the other side of it will be responsible for the best things we ever do. Um, to me, this is not just a, you know, a way of making money. It's, it's something that it's a defining milestone in our, in our species. That's what I think it is. Um, so is that worth investing in? Hell yeah. That's where I am. Uh, but yeah. if, if you're kind of those, one of those investors who, you know, you want to see the, all the proof before you put your money in, then this is not for you. See you at a trillion valuation, um, in 10 years. If, before, before I kind of embraced my love of space, I would have heard a trillion dollar valuation and just I'm not laughed. About our company. I think I'm as about a fusion, you know, at the moment, the industry, yeah. UBS portfolio advisor or whoever, and you say, um, can I, you yeah. know, I've heard that by 2100, the dominant power source of this planet will be nuclear fusion. So therefore there is a huge amount of money. It's got to get out of combustion oil assets and somehow find its way into fusion over this period. I'd like to start getting exposure to this asset class. There is no way of doing it. You can't. There's no ETF for fusion yet. There will be. And there'll be lots of charlatan companies mm, that yeah. and sell you all sorts of animatronic fusion too early and borrow on and all sorts of things that will come. They're not there yet. <laughs> uh, but that is insane. So you're talking about the, what will be the dominant power source of this planet you can't yet get exposure to is just mad. So... Now, I can see that there is an avalanche of capital that will have to be in fusion. And that rising tide will lift all boats. So that's, you know, one side of it. Um, but, the, you know, I don't know how long it will be feasible not to have some exposure to fusion energy in, a, in, in your portfolio. So that's why I say there it is this trillions uh, in, in terms of valuation to be, um, to be realized. Not, I'm not talking about us specifically, but, you know, of course, the valuations will increase. Well, it's, it's increases. absolutely. It, it's all part of that uh, space economy. Um, as really humanity space. becomes a multi-planetary species, um, with uh, with fusion being a, a large part of that, um, it's been great chatting to you today, Richard. Um, just as a sort of final thought, um, you know, you've got a bit of you've got a bit of money flying around. Would you ever spend it on a trip to space? And uh, when, when would you do it if the answer is yes? Well, look, um, here's my view on it. I, I don't need to get to space for any um, practical reason. Um, I am inspired by the endeavor. Uh, and yet mm. I have fired two rockets, which are capable of getting me there. <laughs> I have two behind me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I believe mm. that within the rounds of being responsible, the challenge of propelling yourself into orbit is a rather wonderful one. And, you know, people have given stick to people like Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos for doing it. And I can, I can see both sides of the coin, but I, um, I still think it's, it's rather wonderful. Um, and I think what Richard Branson did to, you know, he's had a, a hell of a career and to, to find himself at this time, you know, building the technology to get himself into space is, is a wonderful thing. Um, I don't, you know, do I want to pay someone else so I can go up there and look out a window? Not really. Um, would I, if the opportunity presents itself, develop my own vehicle to get me there? Yeah. Um, I think that's a wonderful thing. And I think that's a, but you know, it, that's just my view on it. 
um, if if there wasn't that opportunity, would I pay someone else? Um, no problem. Richard Dinan, thank you very much. Thank you.